Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at the Blue Note here in New York City. Flautist and saxophonist Sonny Fortune has had a wonderful decade and one he started his own record label and he writes, produces, and releases material that he wants to put out and he's not under the pressure of the major labels to do so. Also in his five decades as a saxophonist and flautist, he's played with the likes of Miles Davis to Elvin Jones to Mongo Santa Maria, just to name a few. Tonight we're going to sit down and talk about his origins growing up in Philadelphia and we're going to talk about one of his mentors, Odin Pope, who I've profiled here on the Pace Report many, many times. We're also going to talk about how he got learned as well as playing the saxophone and flute. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the sounds of the legendary Mr. Sonny Fortune live here at the Blue Note here in New York City. Sonny, congratulations, you are back, and tonight you are going to be performing with your quartet, and you have a new drummer this evening. Yes, uh, uh, Neil Smith is a uh, new drummer with me, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we kind of rehearsed some of the music, and uh, we're ready to go. You know, you've just come off your your last solo album the the live record and you have over the last decade you formed your own record label and you're pretty much at a point now where you want to record the projects that you want to record and say the things you want to say musically and from also an economic standpoint you're controlling your own destiny well that's true but uh even i mean there was a period in the early uh 80s, uh, late uh, 70s, where <laughs> where I tried to cut it down the middle uh, in terms of uh, doing something that I didn't necessarily want to do, but in terms of just trying to sell records. But other than that, most of my recordings have been 
of things that I felt uh, comfortable in doing. Having my own label uh, makes that feel even more uh, pleasurable because there's no one to answer to but me. You know, it's kind of funny and ironic because your debut record was on an independent label that you self-produced on the Strata East label, right? Right. And because of because of that, it's safe to say that mm, the attitude that I'm embracing today has been with me for quite a while. I am a firm believer, and uh, especially uh, an artist, being able to control his or her own uh, output. You know, I mean, uh, it's kind of hard being an artist if you're being uh, directed into what you should and should not do. Uh, but uh, this expression called jazz, I consider it an art form and have always tried to uh, move in that direction in terms of concerns. But you had a real good run with Blue Note and as well as Atlantic Records and some of the other labels too. What do you think right now that has lacked as far as the major labels now? Because it seems like now there are no NR directors. They are not marketing classical and jazz music anymore. And it seems like you're in the step, you're actually ahead of the curve right now. Well, I'm not certain where I'm placed, but in terms of uh, the dynamics that are out here in the industry, for certain uh, creative music, uh, artistic music, uh, is a hard sell for probably the simple reason that uh, the business of music is a dominant force in the music uh, industry. And the business of music kind of uh, directs more often than not if whatever we did yesterday was successful, then we ought to try it again today. <laughs>
Sonny, you started off in Philadelphia, which is your hometown, and you actually started trying to sing for a little bit before you actually got your calling for the saxophone. Talk about your journey. <laughs> well, I don't know if modern man would like to hear that because of singing was easier. <laughs> We live in a singing reality today, but uh, when I first started out, singing was much easier than playing an instrument. Uh, and so, I, you know, I came from a doo-wop background. Uh, it was about singing in tune and kind of uh, singing doo-wop. Uh, but when I got involved in jazz, actually I forced myself to embrace jazz. Uh, because initially I didn't really like it. Uh, but what appealed to me was the fact that it appeared as if it was uh, an expression that you had to kind of uh, upgrade yourself. Uh, uh, it was uh, uh, international. Coltrane was a global person. Uh, so was Miles. I mean, all of these guys, Monk, uh, uh, Mingus, Max, uh, they were international uh, people. And when, that, when I first heard, and, and, and prior to those guys, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, those cats were, were known around the world. Uh, and um, for me at that particular time, uh, living in North Philly, uh, living in a more of a limited uh, environment, um, it, 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 it kind of said if I'm going to identify with this expression I was going to have to kind of upgrade myself become more aware more and uh, enlightened and so on and so forth a very very good person of the pace report I've profiled on this program many many times was a mentor of yours by the name of Mr. Odin Pope who lived in the same neighborhood and he was the one that kind of influenced you to form your own band so you could express yourself and be heard well it wasn't quite in that kind of a package but what he did say to me <laughs> that was very helpful because at the time I was uh, I've always kind of felt like in order for you to learn you need to be around people that know more than you uh, and so in the beginning when I was trying to understand this music I used to hang around with guys that were doing it as opposed to me trying to figure it out and uh, a lot of times we used to go, I'd go to jam sessions and I would just be sitting there because nobody was like well let's let's try to accommodate Sonny. Uh, it was like, uh, hey, well, let's have some fun, and if you can figure it out, be a part of it, otherwise, watch. And so it was very frustrating for me. And I remember talking to Pope about it one day, and Pope said, well, you know, probably what you ought to do is uh, you should find a group of guys that are on the same level that you're on, and that you, uh, you all can kind of uh, evolve together and rehearse and so on and so forth and actually as 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 minuscule as that may have been that was very helpful because it gave me the opportunity to uh, 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 identify with some guys that uh, uh, wanted to do the same thing and we used to play uh, and I embraced I took that attitude and uh, and moved from, uh, when I was living in Philadelphia, moved from, uh, to some degree, to certain groups of guys. And then we all more or less, well, certainly I, anywhere, we'd go anywhere and play. We'd play out in the park, we'd play on the, in the street, we'd play in the bar, we'd go in a, we'd go in a club and, and, and ask a guy, uh, 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 can we play here? We don't have to get paid, just let us play. So... You know, I don't know if that was a good business move, but uh, that was what uh, uh, I got from that uh, conversation with Odin Pope uh, phew, over 50 years ago. Thank you. 
something very interesting about you is that you I want to piggyback on something you said just a little while ago that you didn't really like jazz at first but when you heard John Coltrane on record for the first and second time it was kind of like Pandora's box open for you musically well what had happened was <clears throat> I used to see a train I saw a train before Cannonball joined the band I saw a train after Cannonball joined the band. Uh, I saw a train after he left uh, Miles' band uh, uh, with, uh, that had Cannonball in it. Uh, but train didn't really hit me that hard until his recording of My Favorite Things. And all I remember was on a Friday night. I don't remember whose house it was, but I remember being at somebody's uh, home on a Friday evening, and they played my favorite, the original, favorite things. And man, I got up early that Saturday morning, went downtown, bought the record, and played it till it turned brown. And that was the beginning of uh, Coltrane completely turning me around. And I understand that you even went to one of the schools in Philadelphia where Train studied and learned some of his uh, musicianship. Yeah, I went to Grinoff's uh, for a while uh, and studied with uh, uh, a, a young man that I'm glad to say is still around, uh, uh, Roland Wiggins, uh, uh, a genius probably, as quiet as is kept. Uh, and uh, he, he was teaching at Grenoble's at the time and I'm not certain if Train had uh, studied under him or not uh, but uh, I've later since found out a lot of guys from Philly uh, studied with him for a while but uh, yeah that what you know since Train wasn't really one of your influences who ended up becoming one of your influences who were some of the people that you were really interested in who kind of because you play flute also I wanted to ask you about that too because there weren't too many flautists that were on the scene in the jazz vein also well i usually tell people i kind of work out of five get of five guys uh coltrane cannonball sonny stitt sonny rollins and eric dolphy those were the guys that hit me the hardest uh of course out of all of those guys eric was the cat that played the flute uh and played the heck out of the flute. Uh, was an incredible musician. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know how I got to where I ended up going uh, because uh, a train, I think, picked up the flute much later in life. I remember I th I've seen some footage of him holding a flute, but I never saw him play one in person. But for me... Uh, You know, I like the instrument. Uh, 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 actually, by just a set of circumstances, and I don't actually recall what they were. But uh, I think the flute was, aside from the alto saxophone, was the second instrument that I that I bought somewhere between there and the tenor. 
Um, because I've kind of always had a tenor, even though I've very seldom played it. Because of Coltrane, probably. What did you think of guys like James Moody and Roland Kirk when they took the flute to a whole nother? And even Frank West. What did you think about those guys when you heard them and thought about how they played the flute in the jazz vein? Well, I thought all of those guys were uh, good flautists. Uh, but the guy that made the most impact on me was a guy by the name of Mauricio Smith, who was a, a flute player that was with Mongo, uh, and he had taken Hubert Law's place. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Mauricio was the guy that I kind of got to know close up. The rest of these guys I saw at a distance, Rasan and and Moody and uh, uh, Frank West and them. I knew these guys, but it was at a distance. But, uh, and I knew uh, Hubert, uh, but, and I knew Hubert a little better than I, than those guys, but uh, I didn't know Hubert as well as I knew Mauricio because Mauricio actually was the other horn that was in the band with Mongo when I was in the band. And the thing that impressed me with, uh, Mauricio was his technique on the flute. I always thought of the flute being a more of a gentle instrument uh, where Mauricio was, I mean, he was playing, uh, uh, had incredible technique. Uh, uh, and that was my inspiration to more or less uh, search for another way of uh, playing or trying to find, and it's an instrument that is I've been wrestling with, and I'm I'm just beginning to reach the point of feeling comfortable with it. <laughs> for another edition of the Pace Report reporting live here at the Blue Note here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank Mr. Sonny Fortune for his time, as well as the staff and management here at the Blue Note. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, peace.